Welcome to the Elevate the Vibe podcast, bringing you juicy convos with thought leaders discussing the wild world of parenting. You don't have to be wealthy to have a trust. A trust is for any family that wants to put a plan in place to protect their family. It's going to allow you the flexibility to put a plan in place according to your wishes rather than having to go through court. That clip was from our guest of the show this week, Krista Hermance, aka the estate planning mom. My name is Jason Berlin. I am the co-host of the Elevate the Vibe podcast, which means there's one other co-host of the podcast, and that is the beautiful, stunning, gorgeousity with the teal blue shirt on, Katie Berlin. Why, thank you, hubby. I appreciate that intro. (laughs) Prior to this episode, we sat down with our guest, Krista, this past weekend to actually create a trust for ourselves and go over the estate planning process. And we'll talk a little bit more about the specifics of that in this episode. But as two people with a young child and another child on the way, it was something that's important to us to ensure that if in the circumstance that something were to happen to the two of us, there's a plan in place to take care of not only our children, but our assets and our businesses as well. And a lot of people, when they hear the word trust, maybe they're not as familiar with it because when people pass in the olden days, they had a will and you'd have parents who'd be like, you're out of the will, son. You're not doing this. You're not doing that. Or you'd, uh, you know, it was a very loose set of boundaries for what was to take place when that person passed away. But nowadays life's a little more complicated Uh, We all have businesses, we all have side hustles, we all have main hustles, we all have side side hustles, and we have kids and we have rental properties, we have all sorts of investments happening. And it's important to have all of those things aligned and a trust is the perfect way to do that. And Krista just really irons out all the info well. So get out your pen and paper and uh, take some notes here because this is a good one. So what happens when the unthinkable happens? Many people believe that estate planning is reserved for the wealthy or for people who are entering the later years of their lives. But what would happen to your spouse, your children, your business, your assets if the unimaginable happens while you're young? Krista Hermans, founder of Hermans Law, specializes in protecting families with minor children through estate planning, offering her clients peace of mind to ensure that their assets are distributed as they would desire. So let's welcome Krista to the show. Well, Krista, welcome to the Elevate the Vibe podcast. We're so excited that you're here, that you're joining us today, and we'd love for you to introduce yourself to our audience. Absolutely. Well, thank you first for having me. Um, I'm very excited to just share information for parents on how they can put plans in place to protect their kids. So I'm an estate planning attorney, uh, also known as the estate planning mom. Um, I started my practice about five years ago when I had my first daughter, who is now uh, about five. And the reason I started it was because I was a new mom and I didn't, as an attorney, want to work those those long attorney hours. And so I decided to go out on my own and start a practice in estate planning. Um, I felt like estate planning was an area where I really enjoyed working with families. Uh, But as I kind of started putting my practice together, I realized that there wasn't a lot of information for parents when they had young kids on estate planning. Because most of the time when you hear about estate planning, it's all about when you're getting older and when you retire and the things you should be considering at that point. And for me as a new mom, my first thought was, well, what happens if you're young and you have minor kids. And so that's really how my practice has developed over the last five years is really just getting out in the community, putting on seminars, webinars, and educating parents on ways that they can actually put plans in place that if something happened, they knew that their kids would be protected. And that's, um, you know, that's where we're at now. We have three office locations. We have a team of about nine. It's a very family oriented practice. Um, All of my team members are parents. um, And, you know, all of our offices, generally when there's, you know, people can actually, you know, talk face to face, they're all kid friendly because I, I didn't want parents to not be able to do their planning because they didn't have a babysitter, right? And so parents can bring their kids to our offices, they can play in our areas, and they can do their planning. Um, And so that's really kind of the atmosphere that I have created in just having this kind of very flexible environment for parents. Which, yeah, this, this whole idea of... 
estate planning for when you are older, when you're getting close to retirement, or when you need to think about long-term care or these various aspects, of course, that's important. And most people that maybe are around our age, you know, let's say people that are from, you know, 20 years old to 50 years old, you know, they're, they're working, they might have children who are still minors. Mm -hmm. They might be thinking about this, but they don't necessarily take the time or energy just because of the like quantity of tasks that there are to do every day with your family to think about it. The first time that I ever was introduced or really started to think about this when we were married, this was back in 2011, I was working for Sotheby's on the real estate side and the area that I was covering, if you're in SoCal, you'll know this area. If not, you may still have heard of these areas, but it was Malibu, Santa Monica, and the Pacific Palisades, which are all very well ex- to do, expensive, yes. high net worth. Yeah, I was I was in marketing, so it wasn't like I was an agent, but I came across and saw a lot of information about clients, and all of these clients are high net worth individuals, and I would see their their homes that were being listed, and sometimes I would see the contracts. And I noticed that almost every single person had a trust. All of their properties were in a trust. And one of my friends who I worked with, she was, uh, you know, a few years older than I was. And I would ask her, I would say like, why, why does everybody put properties in a trust? Now, some of them were celebrities, so they didn't want their name out there about where they're buying, where they're living, you know, and and some of them are really interesting choice names for their trusts. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But... At that moment, my friend was explaining to me that there are so many people that think that having a will is the best course of action because that's like terminology that you hear when you're planning. But if you have a will and you're very high net worth or you have a lot of assets or maybe you don't even have to be high net worth and have a lot of assets, there's a different process that takes place when you have a will versus when you have a trust and it can get messier sometimes if you have a lot to be divided up having will versus trust so we can get into some of that but that was really the first time I started to think about it and I remember I asked my parents at the time like hey do you have a will do you have a trust have you ever thought about this I come from um, families that are pretty large my parents are divorced and then there's you know step siblings and half siblings so we have big families and I thought like man I would never want to have to all of us, we live in different states. Like, can you imagine all of us having to fly in and like this entire process? What if we, what if we didn't have to proceed in that direction? What if we, it was more simplified? So that was really the first time I thought about it. And then now as parents, we're like, we need to get our shit together and like (laughs) get this figured out. Yeah. So maybe could you kind of help the audience understand the difference between a will and a trust? Yeah, absolutely. So um, first thing I want to say is that I am a licensed California attorney. So everything that we're talking about is specific to California. So if you do have listeners outside of California, it's still really good information because if anything, it allows them to the understanding and then to reach out to an attorney in their state. Um, And so get exactly what you're saying it's it's surprisingly you have a really good understanding of the concept of estate planning because most people they don't they have this idea that you know all you need is a will like we don't need trust because it's for the wealthy and so there's just a few things that i will kind of tie into what you said that i think is important for people to understand so in estate planning and when we, we look at estate planning it's kind of the overall process of estate planning and within estate planning there's all of these different documents that do different things some of the things that you mentioned, a will, a trust, other things include advanced healthcare directive, which allows you to identify an agent to be able to make healthcare decisions on your behalf if you are unable to. There's a power of attorney document. This allows you to be able to identify an agent to be, be able to make financial decisions on your behalf if you are unable to do so. And then a bunch of other kind of documents that kind of play into that whole estate planning process to put a plan in place. So just speaking specifically about a will and a trust is, A will is probably the most known thing when it comes to estate planning, like you said. The problem is is that people don't really understand what a will does. And so this is where the difference between a will and a trust come in, is a will is basically just a legal document where you say, 
you know, if something happens to me, this is who I want to get my stuff. And this is how, who I want to be guardians for my kids. It allows you to do both. A will in California, it doesn't avoid probate court. Okay, and probate court is this process where any assets that you have, if it's kind of over this mark of $166,250, $166, which in California isn't very much, especially if you own a home. And when I say own a home, it doesn't mean your home is paid off. If you have a mortgage, you own this home, right? So any home in California, right? If you own it, it's this probate process if you have this house in your name. And so the probate process basically says that if you have a will or don't, this is how your stuff is distributed. In California to go through probate court it's very 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 expensive right it takes a long time um, generally it's one to two years and that's pre-COVID so now we're seeing we're seeing an increase in three to six months in actual court time that it takes this whole probate process to go through okay and it's completely public um, meaning anybody can go down to the courthouse pull the documents and find out what you own who you owe money to and who's gonna get your stuff and you see this on TMZ right with celebrities if they pass away and they have a will, TMZ is reporting what's going on with it, right? And then you see some things on TMZ where they're like, I remember like Luke Perry specifically, it was like he had a trust. Nobody knows what's going on because it's private, okay? So that's kind of the difference. When you have a will, and this is probably one of the biggest myths I hear that people have or this misconception is that if you have a will, that's all you need, right? It avoids probate. That's not true. All a will does is it guarantees probate because it tells the probate court how you want your stuff distributed. Okay, that's the first thing. On the other side of that, the other planning tool that we use is a trust. And we use them as estate planning attorneys. They work together, right, because it's different parts. But what a trust is, basically, it's just a legal agreement where you as the grantor, which is the creator of the trust, put specific instructions in writing to your trustee, which is the person who agrees to hold legal title to all of the assets in your trust. And they do all of this for the benefit of your beneficiaries. So while you are alive and you have a revocable living trust, you are the grantor, meaning you created it. You are the trustee, meaning you are in complete control over all of the stuff in your trust. And you are also the beneficiary, meaning it's all there for your benefit. You get to use it however you want. It's only if something happens that you have all of these instructions that your backup person or what we call successor trustee or some people know it as executor, they then follow the instructions according to your wishes in your trust. It keeps it private, right? It keeps it out of court because you have all these assets that are named in the name of your trust rather than in your name personally. So it avoids that probate cost, that probate process, saving a ton of money. Probate is very expensive. It's set by statutory fees. Whereas when it's in a trust, it's all handled privately and can be done in a lot quicker, okay? One of the biggest things that you kind of alluded on is you have all these people that you saw in very exclusive areas in California that are very expensive properties. You don't have to be wealthy to have a trust. A trust is for any family that wants to put a plan in place to protect their family. It's going to allow you the flexibility to put a plan in place according to your wishes rather than having to go through court. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. Well, I feel like wills are just kind of old fashioned. You know, you hear about like the older people who are just like, oh, you're going to get out of my will, son, if you do something, you know? So it's like, <laughs> yeah. it's kind of an old school it, it, mentality. I mean, they are, they're an older planning tool, I, I feel like. And I think it was just more mainstream um, that yeah. people just didn't use trust as much. In California, you know, probate isn't a great process. In some parts of the country, probate is actually easy and people are like, all you need is a will. But in California, if you own property and or have minor children, my recommendation is generally a trust because it provides you so much more flexibility, keeps costs down, it keeps things simple, right? Especially with a blended family, when you have parents that have, um, you know, remarriages and there's other kids, it makes it very clear. A lot of times people don't understand that without planning documents in place and things that have to go through probate, when they own their name, when they own property or assets in their name or jointly in a blended family, what they would actually want to happen to their stuff if something happened to them may not happen because of a blended family or how they own titles to things. And that's where estate planning really comes in to make sure that, you know, what are your goals? What would you want to happen? And then making sure that it's aligned with your estate plan. I see it happen all the time. Blended families, um, ownership in a property is what we call joint tenants with right of survivorship in California are on a house and one one um, person passes away, well, then everything then goes to that that new, that other spouse. And in that case, their kids 
part in line to get anything from that house anymore. The evil stepmom syndrome. It, yeah, yeah, it's very. I mean, it's very eye opening in the sense when people come to me and they're like, "Oh, my mom passed away. Everything went to my stepdad." But there's no plan, mm-hmm. and I see this a lot with clients. You know, they they might be SOL at that point um, yeah. because there wasn't planning in place. And even if there is a will in place, when it goes through the probate court process, if it's not necessarily ironed out specifically to say, like, each child gets, let's say, it's four kids, 25% of the total assets in the estate, Mm -hmm. it's up to the court to decide how these assets are divided. So the court is generally going to follow the instructions of the person that passed away. They, they want to carry out their wishes, right? Um, obviously, sometimes there is issues with the family agreeing on maybe what's included with the probate or what assets are in there. But the biggest thing with that is if you own title as joint tenants and the other spouse is alive, it doesn't go through probate, right? It just goes to that other spouse. And then at that point, if you say, well, I want my kids you know, each to get... 25% of my estate. Well, your house isn't in your estate going through probate because it just went to the other spouse. It avoids probate, but it's now completely into the other spouse. And so if there is that blended family, those four kids get nothing from that house because it's now in the name of the other the other um, spouse. But even if, let's say that there wasn't a spouse, let's say it was just like one parent, but then mm-hmm. that parent passed away and let's say there was okay. like four children and the parent had in their mind thought like, okay, well, each child will get something equal. But Mm -hmm. then if it's not ironed out, then the court gets to decide that. Correct? Yeah. 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 So it's, it's, that's where things can get messy, especially if kids aren't getting along. And, you know, one of the biggest things with, with having to go through probate is if there's issues with the family to start, they're probably not going to get resolved going through probate court. It's going to probably Amplify Make it, it worse. Mm-hmm. They can pull the family apart. Siblings are going to hate each other and never talk to each other. Um, I just, you know, it's, and it's just, it's amazing to me to see how greedy people get when people pass away and just the level that they bring to the table on wanting stuff that's not even worth a lot of money. You know, it's just, it's unfortunate. And so by having all of this planning done, by putting it in the trust, it's making it very clear. It's keeping it private. It's keeping it out of court. It's trying to keep it out of court. I feel like it's so heartbreaking hearing about stories like that. And I know that a trust isn't considerably that much more expensive than a will. No, it's not. Um, for, for my practice, it's it's nominal compared to it to, to have a trust package. And honestly, I don't do a lot of will packages for people just because in California, it doesn't make sense um, from where they're at from a planning perspective. Even if they don't own a home, but they have life insurance and they have minor kids right? Retirement accounts. Well, in California, minor children can't inherit money or property. And so if something happened to both parents, or maybe it was a single parent, um, and that money went to the child, that money would have to go, like if it was a life insurance policy, let's say it's a million dollars, which I see happen, right? Million dollar life insurance policy that goes to the kids, that money actually can't go to them personally. So it has to go through a court blocked account where the court assigns somebody to monitor it on their behalf and be in charge of it. And they can use it for, you know, expenses they need for education or, you know, paying for groceries, things like that. But when they turn 18, they get all of that money in one lump sum. Mm. And a million dollar life insurance policy for an 18 year old is a lot of money, right? Um, I'm not 18. And if somebody gave me a million dollars, I'd be like, no, okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll figure out something to do with it. I'll be going to Guam a lot. Exactly. And so by having a trust in place, you can actually have these plans that say, you know, I want the money going to my trust for the benefit of my child rather than going through probate court or rather than going through court to get to them, their minor. And so that's really where planning comes in for parents with minor children is having these, you know, what are their plans are? Because a lot of times they don't really think about the impact, right? I see it all the time where people will have their spouse listed as their, on their life insurance policy with their minor kids listed as the backups. And, you know, they don't check it frequently and they've now had a couple kids. And so they haven't added the other kids on their life insurance policy, which is totally fine. But then if they don't think about if something actually happened to both spouses, if both of them, that, how would that money go to the kids? And so it's not, it, they don't really think through it in that sense. And that's where we come in to make sure that, you know, you understand what the impact could be. And this is how we prevent it. This is how we actually do what you want and put that plan in place. 
With having young children, I do want to touch on assigning guardians and that process and how that works. Okay. So um, in, in California, if something were to happen to one parent, the kids are, you know, the other parent is the guardian, right? You don't need to nominate that other parent. Um, That's just, you know, California courts want to make sure families are staying together. It's only if something happens to both parents. And I see this a lot where people call frantically like, oh, I'm going on a vacation with my husband for anniversary this weekend. And I don't have any guardians named. And, um, you know, I don't want to be stressing about it. You know, I want to get something in writing. And so you can create this guardian nomination that says, if something happens to me and the other parent, this is who I would want to be guardians for my children. And, you know, this is something that we do as part of our process with planning for families with young kids. That's our focus is making sure that it's very specific the way that you would want it. And so I recommend having three, three different kind of levels. You have a primary and if something happens, this is the primary guardian that you would want. It can be one person. It can be joint, right, together. And then having a backup. And then not just that one backup, but what we call is the secondary backup. Okay. You never know what season of life somebody's going to be in. What if, the, what if the person that you chose is in a car accident with you, right? And then at that point, if they're the only person you've nominated, you don't have any backups. So it's always a good idea to have those, those backups listed. When you're choosing guardians for your kids, and I find that parents put it off because they can't choose, right? They just keep putting it to the back of their to-do list. It keeps getting put down because they can't decide. Well, without anything in writing, the court would have no idea who you would actually want because you haven't put this in writing. And if something were to happen and you didn't have any guardian nomination written down, then it would be your family petitioning the court for custody of the kids for guardianship. And then it might not be the person that you would want, right? Or it could be a few people and the court would have no idea because you haven't written down legally in writing who you would want. And so it would almost be like this custody battle where the court would be deciding who would be the best fit for your kids. And so I urge people, even if you can't decide, start the process, make a list, because anything you put in writing is better than nothing at all. And that information could also go into a trust or a will as well. It's just like a separate document that would be added. into. Yeah. So the way that we do it is we actually have a separate document where we do the guardian nomination. We also put it in the will so that it's in that document and in the trust, depending on how you have guardian nomination identified, we will put specific instructions in there that pertain to taking care of the kid. Now, outside of guardianship, going back to wills versus trusts and trust, let's say that you have businesses that you own or property that you own that maybe are located in different states also. How mm-hmm. does all of that level up into this process also? So without having proper planning in place, if somebody passed away and they had property in different states, generally a probate would have to be open to each state for that property, right? To be then passed down, whether it's according to their will or whatever the the, um, state law is. Um, So what we do from a planning perspective on two sides, one dealing with businesses is usually depending on the type of business, we'll do a business assignment that says, you know, something happens to you, your, your business interest is assigned to your trust, so your successor trustee can manage it. Because without that, and people don't, people don't see this until they come across it. If somebody passes away and they own a business, you know, their family can't just go in and start managing the business on their behalf. I actually have a case right now where this is happening where the, a dad is, the dad is incapacitated and his son tried to go to the bank to access money from the bank account for the business and they will not allow him to. And so it's kind of having this planning in place. And if, you know, if somebody passes away and they own a business, then it's going through probate court to get the probate court to give permission for them to then act on behalf of the business. Okay. From a property perspective, any property that generally that you own, right? And again, it doesn't have to be owned outright. It still can have a mortgage that most people in California or anywhere, you know, mostly in California have a mortgage. Um, is you basically take your deed or your, the grantee that you have in your name or you and your spouse, and you put it into your name as the trustees of your trust, right? So then it's moving, it's moving title from you personally to you as the trustee of your trust. So we do that for all of the properties that you have in California so that all of your houses are owned in the name of your trust, because if they're not in the name of your trust, then they're having to go through probate if something happens. 
right? So it's making sure that those are put in the name of your trust. If you have property in different states, we actually have to work with an attorney in another state to get that, that deed transferred to your trust in California. And we do that all the time because you know, people own property everywhere. So it's making sure that all of your assets are then kind of funneled, whether it's in the name of your trust or pointing to your trust or however that's set up, depending on the type of asset. So let's say that you're like 25 years old and you had a child, but then let's say that you start a business and your business becomes successful and then you have multiple properties and maybe they're located in different states and then you begin to add all of these different assets into your trust. That's something that as time goes on, you make addendums. You don't necessarily have to go through the whole process over again. It's just like slowly as you grow and build, you add these different assets in. Yeah, it's, it's basically that concept. So when you're, let's say 25, you create a trust because you have a minor child life insurance policy. You don't own a home yet. But then you have this base set up. And so that what you're doing is you're saying that, you know, if something happened to me, my life insurance policy would go into my trust to be distributed to my child at the ages that I set, maybe 25, 30, 35, right? To keep that money kind of protected over this period rather than everything going to them at 18 through the probate court. So, you know, 25, you create this trust. Well, let's say at 30, you buy a house. Well, then at that point, you want to make sure you put your house in your trust. You don't even have to come back to me. You just tell the title, the company, when you're buying your house, here's my trust, put it in the name of my trust, right? And so you're going to continue to do this. If you buy property out of state, get them to put it in the name of your trust, right? And this trust, it just stays with you. It's a revocable living trust. It stays with you over your lifetime. Um, the only time you need to make changes to it is if, you know, you want to change somebody's position as an agent, um, or maybe you change guardianship. Sometimes, People don't like people later on in life. You know, they go on vacation with them and they find out they're horrible parents and they don't want them to be guardians anymore. So we had that happen one time. Um, so we had to go in and change all the guardians. And these are things that you can make changes to throughout your life. I mean, you're going to grow as a person, right? Your, your choices are going to change. Things in your life are going to change. People are going to come in and out of your life. You're going to update it. But at least having that base to start is going to just, you know, have that plan in place that if something happened, and that's what this really is, it's almost like an insurance policy. It's if something happened, these are your wishes. They're legally documented to make sure it gives you peace of mind, right? Knowing that your wishes are there and that your kids are protected. Now you have talked about having, you know, the, the trust where each person is named. Let's say that you have Let's say you have a trust, but let's say that you have a 401k through your company and you've been with the company since before you ever started your trust. And on your 401k, you said, I want my spouse to be my beneficiary. Well, let's say you and the spouse are no longer together. You're, you know, you divorced or something happens to this spouse. So on your 401k, your spouse is still listed as your beneficiary, but in your trust, your spouse is not a part of that because yeah. they're, you know, they have a separate life or they've moved on. And how would that process work if beneficiaries are designated, even if it's not a 401k, but if it's through a life insurance policy or other policies, but it doesn't necessarily match with your trust, which one sort of trumps the other in those scenarios? So it depends on the type of policy, whether it's a retirement or life insurance, but um, generally in California, if you have a, like a prior spouse and there's been a divorce, the prior spouse wouldn't be able to receive it, um, which is good because generally, you know, if you're divorced from them, you wouldn't want them to receive it. So it, it's generally, um, and then at that point, if it was then to go to the heirs, if there was, if there was a trust in place, it would go outside of the trust because it wasn't ever designated as the beneficiary for the trust. And so then it would just, it, it really depends on the situation, but then it would go outside of the trust, which for retirement plans, generally you kind of want them to go outside of the trust because there's more tax benefits, um, you know, for it going to a person rather than the trust um, and then receiving it in that way. Um, but there has been some, some recent changes in the law that went into effect this past December, um, so December 2019, where we no longer have this stretch out period for, for retirement plans. They have these these things that was called the secure act that was put into place where you have like this time period that you have to, you have to withdraw from. It's 
like over the course of a 10 year period. And so just kind of very specifics. To, and we usually go through that in the estate planning process to kind of understand how much money do you have in a retirement account? You know, what would be the impact if something happened to you that it was good to go to your children? Um, and so like minor children are an exception until they get to a certain age and then they have to start withdrawing. So there's kind of different things that play into it depending on if it's a retirement account, like a qualified plan, um, life insurance or a comp completely different aspect. Um, and so it's really just kind of based on the specific situation. Is there any way if you have minor children that they can access any assets that you may have before they turn 18? Or is it like regardless, they, they really need to wait till they're 18? So are you talking about if there's a trust? Yes. So let's say there was a, let's say there was a trust and let's say that um, we had like $10 million. Let's say that we're like, you know, through property and all of our finances, we had $10 million. And let's say something happened to the two of us and our guardians didn't have that level of finances in, yeah. in their lives. So our, let's say our children went to private schools and, and had access to just these different scenarios that then the guardians wouldn't necessarily be able to handle that financially. Yeah. Is there a way that you could have the um like the heirs or the trustees your minors receive any of those financial benefits prior to turning 18 can you put a plan in place for something like that yeah so that that's exactly what we do is so when we when we look at the estate plan and we look at what your goals are we're going to say okay one who are the guardians okay so those are the guardians that the kids they manage the the welfare and the benefit of the kids if something were to happen on the other side of that is you have your trust and in your trust, you have what we call successor trustees. And these are the people that you identify to step in and manage your plan if something were to happen to you, okay? They can be the same people, meaning the guardians can be the same as a successor trustee, meaning they manage the kids and they also manage the money for the benefit of the kids. But they don't have to be, which I like because maybe you have guardians that you love and they're amazing with your kids, but they're horrible with money. You don't want them managing the money. So you can actually identify somebody separately that manages that portion of the trust that's separate from the guardians. And so it's almost like a check and a balance. Okay, so when, so that now that that's kind of understood as you have these two different sides. And then also one thing with the trust is you probably aren't gonna say that you want your kids to get money at 18 when you have a trust, right? That That's the probate process. With a trust, you're gonna say, well, I would want my kids to get maybe a quarter when they turn um, 25, half of their money when they turn 30, and the remainder when they turn 35. So it's really spreading out that money over the course of their, um, you know, early adulthood into adulthood to make sure that they're not spending it in a way you wouldn't want them to, right? right? Yeah. Um, and so you, generally we would have the trust set up like that. And so if something were to happen when parents had minor kids and they passed away, then those guardians depending on whether they worked with a successor trustee or were the successor trustee, then those guardians would be able to get money from the successor trustees, from the kids' money, to help them with health, education, maintenance, and support. So if they need money for them to go to private school, if they need money for them to go to summer camp or to be in part, involved in these extracurricular activities for whatever it is, then that successor trustee is gonna be able to provide money from the kids' trust to the guardians to help with all of these expenses, right? It's not like the money just sits there. They can use it if they need it. Um, because, you know, I always tell parents, when you're looking at guardians, you should have money set aside that if something happened to you, it's to take care of your kids. Like life insurance is the best way. It's the, it's the most inexpensive way to make sure that if something happened, your kids would have money to be cared for. Because the guardians that you name, well, I do see it sometimes, especially with grandparents, that they would be able to cover the cost of the kids. When you are identifying guardians, they didn't have your kids. They didn't commit to financially supporting your children, right? So you should be providing that financial support to make sure that they can take care of your kids. It shouldn't be a burden on them to be able to have to take on these additional amounts to be. They should have money to support them to be able to provide that. That's exactly the point that I was like hoping we would get to because I could, like you're saying, it they didn't necessarily choose to have those children or maybe they mm -hmm. had children and like you're saying they're grandparents and they've reduced their expenses they're living in a way that works for them but they're not necessarily thinking about like private schools or college tuition or summer camp like you mentioned mm -hmm. or 
braces or anything else that kids may need. You know, they're yeah. like, you know, that was, in, that was 30, yeah, 30 years, years ago, ago, 40 mm-hmm. years ago. I don't have to think about that anymore. And then it's like, oh, wow, I have to go through this process all over again. Yeah, exactly. You touched on this briefly, but I want to dive into it also because these are other terms that I think people have heard of, a will versus a living will and the advanced healthcare directive and what that means. Yeah. So I, I've had people very confused by the naming terminology. Um, I've had um, people that have said, oh, you know, my, my parent passed away. They had a will. Can you help us? So they send me the will, but it's not a will. It's a living will. And a living will in California is a healthcare directive. It's not a will that says, if something happens to me, this is how I want my stuff distributed and passed down to my family. A living will, which in California is known as an advanced healthcare directive, says, you know, do you want to be cremated or buried? Do you want to provide organ donation? Do you want extreme measures with prolonged life support? So it's, it's basically, you know, if something happens and I can't say how I want my healthcare done, this is what this living will or advanced healthcare directive, as we call it in California, is. And so there is that confusion. That's living will is, is healthcare related. It doesn't have anything to do with the probate aspect of distributing your stuff. That is a will or um, a pour over will is what we have with how, when you have a trust. Um, there's lots of confusing names for it, unfortunately. And, and you know, I, I find that when people do their own planning online, using like a document prepare, this is where the confusion comes in. And that's exactly what happened with this one person that came in is they did it online. They thought they needed a living will, but that's not actually what they needed. And so that's where, you know, I, I have concern when people use these online document prepares is they, they aren't, they don't know what they need and they're just going off what they think they need. And so it, it gets very confusing. In the example that you gave of the gentleman who attempted to go to the bank to help his dad's business and his dad was yeah. incapacitated. Now let's say in that scenario, there's a living will created. When mm-hmm. you have a living will and it's an advanced healthcare directive, do you typically identify someone to make medical decisions for you in the event that you're unable to make them for yourself? Yeah, so that's what a living will does or advanced healthcare directive is you identify an agent to be able to make healthcare decisions on your behalf if you are unable to do so. That doesn't have anything to do though with a bank scenario because that that the banking scenario would be more like a power of attorney document. The power of attorney document allows you to say, if I, if I don't have capacity, this is the person I would want to be able to manage my finances. One thing that's important to remember with the power of attorney document, it generally doesn't work once somebody's passed away. A lot of people think, oh, we, we had a power of attorney. We can go do any of the stuff we need to do after you know, after mom passed away. But the power of attorney is generally only good while they're alive and incapacitated. And people don't, people don't understand that. Um, and that's where some of the other planning documents that we do, again, in this whole estate planning process to make sure people are protected. There's also someone called, or an identifier called springing power of attorney. Can you touch yeah. on the difference between power of attorney and springing power of attorney? Yes. So in California, We have the ability when you are creating a a power of attorney document for financial, you can either say, I want this to be effective immediately, meaning once you sign it, you have identified these agents, they are now in effect can go and be your agent. Most of the clients that we are working with are families with young kids and they don't need a power of attorney document in place right now. So we make it effective upon incapacity. So it only springs into effect if something were to happen and they were no longer able to, they didn't have the coherence um, or capacity to make financial decisions on their behalf. And that also springing power of attorney, could that be applied if you want somebody to make medical choices for you as well? So the springing power of attorney is separate from the advanced healthcare directive. Just financial. Separate documents. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So an advanced healthcare directive, you could still put that in place when you're alive. And choose oh, that. Oh, you absolutely need to have it in place while well, you're alive. Yes, 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 sorry. <laughs> if there's, it's hard yes, to do that when you're six yes, feet. Yes, even one step further than what you said. But it, because it's, it's some type of event, because all of the stuff that we talk about from a planning, 
you want to do this stuff while you're healthy and you're well and you have the you have the ability to make mental decisions and put your put your wishes in writing because it's when some crisis happens where there's some event that if you don't have it then that's where the court has to get involved because you don't have the mental ability to make this and so with the power of attorney the advanced healthcare directive these need to be do these need to be done prior to any type of incapacitating event. You know, it's, it's in this kind of pre-planning stage where you're healthy and things are good. And a lot of times people don't want to deal with it or they don't want to think about it. Um, but that's when it needs to be done. And I, I see that a lot. Like I see people that just sort of say, that's not something I want to think about right now, or that's not something I want to talk about, or maybe there's not even a lot of transparency, you know, like with, with parents to children on that regardless if they have assets or they do not have assets. It's almost this thought process, like if I talk about it, then it's more real or I'm going to bring it upon myself. So they think that avoiding it is the way to go or just holding off. But it's like, you don't want to be in a situation where you're like this young man who went to the bank to try to help his dad's business. I mean, maybe his dad had employees that he was paying. Who knows? What if you have Mm -hmm. a business that has... 5,000 employees and it's like nobody can pay them and continue their, you know, continue that legacy on. I would hope someone with 5,000 employees would have some sort of trust set up, but. (laughs) Yeah, you you would hope so. You never know. Um, So (laughs) I find, I I definitely, I hear what you're, what you're saying. And I, I find, because a lot of my clients that come to me, you know, again, they're younger right? And this sparks the thought process of, well, what do my parents have, right? It kind of gets that conversation going. I, I have it a lot where we have clients come in, they get their plan in place, they feel great, you know, peace of mind, but then they're like, well, now my parents need it because I don't want to have to go through probate court. I don't want to have to deal with, with their estate. And so then they start having conversations with their parents. It's hard. I, I see some parents that they shut them out. They don't want to talk to them about it. But in the same, or they'll say, oh, don't worry, I already have that handled because they did it online and they think they have peace of mind knowing like, oh, I have my plate, I have my documents in place, but they're not actually the documents they need. And so you kind of have to keep pushing to make sure because you want to do what your parents want, right? You want to make sure that their wishes are fulfilled. So it's it's having that hard conversation um, and doing that because without it, you don't know. On the other side of that is, you know, people think, oh, you know, I'm too young. I don't need to put that plan in place. The one scenario that I kind of, I, I bring up, for example, when it comes to the advanced healthcare directive is Terry Shrivo. Do you know who she is? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. So she was 25 years old. She married in Florida. She had a stroke in her house. And um, she, you know, over like a, the course of a two week period, you know, at, at the end of that two week period, they tried everything and she was in this persistent vegetative state. And she didn't have any healthcare directive. They didn't have anything in writing that says what she wanted. And so her husband at the time, he wanted to take her off life support because she, you know, he didn't think she had any quality of life in the state that she was in. Her parents on the other side did not want her taken off life support. They said it was against her religious wishes. Um, and this was a very highly publicized, a very long court proceeding. It went up to president of the United States at the time, it went to the Vatican, like it was just, you know, highly publicized. It was over the course of 15 years that she was on this life support, right? This machine's keeping her alive, where the court in the end ended up deciding for the husband, he prevailed, and he took her off life support, and she passed away shortly thereafter. But it was 15 years of legal battles. Can you imagine the money that was spent? Because she didn't have anything legally documented that says what she wanted. And so when people say, oh, I'm young, I don't need to worry about it, she was 25 and she had a stroke. And so you just, you never know. And this makes sure that your wishes are very clear. Unfortunately, like we're all going to get to that place one day, not necessarily having a stroke and being on life support, but like we're all going to get to that place. So why not plan for it? Just have the preparation. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people just think it's kind of like just something that isn't, it's not applicable to them, right? I think a lot of times people think, oh, I'm not, I'm not the level that I need it. And it's, I mean, it's literally everybody needs some type of legal documents, right? There's different levels depending on, you know, assets and things that you want and, and things, but even a base approach, there are certain legal documents that if something happened, your wishes are legally in writing to say what you would want. So if you are over the age of 18, even for college kids, I have college kids right now, 
whose parents they're bringing them in to get an advanced healthcare directive, power of attorney document, HIPAA authorization. So that if something happens, those parents, because at this point their kids are 18, they are no longer able to get information from them. They're protected by HIPAA, right? So these documents give the parents the ability to talk to doctors. You know, if they go off to college and there's an emergency and they're in the, in the hospital, parents want to make sure that they can get on the phone and talk to a doctor, right? And these documents allow them to do that. Going both That's ways. Yeah. yeah. Even thinking about it in that respect that once your child is 18, because once your child turns 18, sure, they're a legal adult, but yeah. like, they don't know nothing. Yeah. Right? <laughs> they're yeah. kids. I mean, they're just starting out <laughs> yeah. in the world. It doesn't necessarily yeah. mean that they have the, they're having beers. They're smoking the marijuana tablets. They're not thinking about <laughs> life decisions. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Or like, but their parents might be the best person to make decisions for them on their behalf. And they generally would want their parents to make decisions for them. And they just, once they turn 18, they no longer have that ability. And so a lot of parents don't think about it or like, or they'll think, oh, well, they're still on my health insurance. So, you know, I, you know, something happened, I can, you know, I, I'm covered that I can still get information. That is not true. Mm. Right. Even if they're on your health insurance, they're still protected by HIPAA. Same thing with college. You're paying parents are paying college tuition. Oh, well, I can find out what's going on back in college. No, you cannot. It is protected. You need to get a release. It's called a FERPA, right? You go to the school's website, pull up this release, have the child sign it so that you can contact the school if you need to, to find out what's going on, figure out what's going on with grades because otherwise everything is protected. It's for their benefit. I remember years ago, Jason and I had the same primary care doctor. I mean, we still do now, but, uh, he had an appointment with a primary care doctor like earlier in the day. And then I went in the afternoon and she knew both of us, she knew we were married. And I said something along the lines like, yeah, you, you know, you got to see my husband earlier today. And she was like, I don't know, because she had to pretend like, you know, like with HIPAA, she just couldn't say. And I was like, oh, right, right. Wow. Like, you know, huh. she couldn't even say yes. to me like, oh yeah, he was here. Yeah. You know, she was like, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I think she I was there. that rash that he had. It was yeah. <laughs> better. You're like, oh yeah. That, that, that wasn't that's me. That was right. someone else. So I don't know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah. She's like, all that testing he came in for. Yeah. Wow. Like, Gosh, that took hours. Exactly. <laughs> there for that reason, from a production perspective. Exactly. So. That's hilarious. Now, what if you have a lot of assets, but you also have a lot of debt? And maybe your debt is in the form of, like we're saying, mortgages. So it's still an asset, but there's mm -hmm. a lot of debt there. How will that be transferred down to trustees? Or if you don't have a trust, if it's in a will, how is that handled when it comes to, hey, there's outstanding payments yeah. to be made on these assets liabilities and you know you're mm -hmm. the next in line yeah so I, I there's a lot of questions in that one it's hard to kind of give an overall answer but it doesn't matter the amount of debt that would be required or that would somebody would have for an estate to still have to go through probate even if you own a house that's worth nine hundred thousand dollars and you have an eight hundred and fifty thousand dollar mortgage still has to go through probate to get transferred right and so there may not be any money left after it goes through to be able to give to the beneficiaries or heirs, depending on what's going on. Um, but it still would need to go through. And, and it depends on the situation, if it's a will or if it's a trust, um, you know, depending on what kind of bill it is. Is it a credit card bill? Is it, um, you know, a medical bill? And, you know, is there a way that we can negotiate paying it? You know, if there's no money left, there's no money left. They don't get any money um, from the estate. So, you know, are they married? Is it a joint um, you know, bill. So there's lots of different kinds of ways to consider it. And I think each situation is going to be very specific to that one. So it's kind of hard to give a general idea, but um, hopefully that gives you kind of an idea. Yeah. So it's, it really is dependent on the type of debt. And just because you have debt doesn't necessarily mean it's absolved if someone passes away. Correct. There could still be the need that you have to mm. pay for that debt, even if someone passes away. Like yeah, so generally in a will or trust, like it specifically states in there, um, you know, my bills are to be paid prior to beneficiaries receiving assets. And what if your liabilities far outweigh your assets, though? It depends on the type of assets that you have. Yeah, so, so like if you... Obviously money would be easier to liquidate than <laughs> stuff or, you know, having estate sales and getting that money. So it's just, there's a kind of bunch of different ways that I could go about it. Hmm. 
So basically, buy everything in cash <laughs> right towards the end there. So, you know, yeah, because if you think about like car payments or let's say your home's not paid off, I mean, those might be treated differently than if you have outstanding credit card debt or medical debt or something along those lines that needs to be paid. Yeah, exactly. When it comes to the majority of questions that people come to you with, what do you see are like the most common issues or like what's, what's sort of like the most common scenario that you see that you help people with? So I'd say one of the biggest issues people have is putting off doing estate planning because they can't decide on who to have as their guardians for their kids, who they want to manage stuff on their behalf. Um, and so one of the first things we do is we'll just kind of talk through, you know, if something happened today, who would step in? Right. And, and a lot of times it's, especially for kind of our generation is it's like, well, we would want our grandparents, we would want the grandparents to, to step in and be because they're, they're young enough that they would be able to handle it. And so a lot of times people think, well, they're not always going to be young enough. Right. And then who do we plan for after that? Well, you need to plan for right now because you can update your plan anytime you need to. And so it's planning for the right now. That's important. So if something happened right now, who would you want? Don't plan for 10 15 years down the road, if you have young kids, you plan for right now and then you update it, you know, in three years and five years to match whatever that situation is at that time. Um, another thing is, is people, they don't do planning because the spouses won't, can't decide on guardians, right? You're going to have to compromise, right? You're going to have to talk through it. There's, you know, certain things to take into consideration is how, how do they raise their kids if they have kids, you know, how, um, you know, are, do they do it in the same style that you would want your kids raised? Right. If you're super religious and, you know, you would want potentially a super religious family to be there as the guardians, right, to be able to kind of have that, that lifestyle. Um, other things is where do they live? You know, are they in the same vicinity of where you're at? If you have young kids, it may not be as important. But if they're older kids, then which you're, you know, if this, this situation happened where there was all of this stuff going on with your kids, would you want to have to then take them out of their home and their schools that they're in and then move them across country? So, you know, location is, can sometimes be a big thing. The guardians that you're looking at identifying, do they have other kids that are around the same age? Would it be, you know, easy for them to be part of this family? Or do, are all their kids older and grown, right? So all of these kind of different factors that you have to consider. And you're going to have to compromise. If they're, if just because you can't decide, doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, right? You got to get something in writing. You got to get something legally in writing that says if something happens, this is who you would want to be and plan for right now. Now, something you touched on, let's say that the guardians that you choose do live in a different state, which could be common, um, you know, very common depending on how often people move, if they're moving for work or a lot of people can, as jobs become more remote, people might decide like, hey, I actually want to move somewhere else yeah. and I can work from anywhere. All right. So if you have young children and let's say that there is a trust and the guardians do not live in the same state, when those children move to the new state, let's say it was they're here in California, something happens, <laughs> the, let's say the parents live in Nevada, and now the children are moving to Nevada. Is the trust under California law still because that's where it was created? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to be followed according to California law. Uh, and I'm actually glad you brought up the guardianship in a different state aspect because there's one thing from a planning perspective that's really important um, that most parents don't really consider but it's what we call short-term guardian nomination and so I see this a lot where parents are in a location maybe they got there was a transplant for their job right and they have no family around they have no friends it's a new location if something happened and let's say you went out on a date and you had a babysitter watching the kids would that babysitter actually know anybody's cell phone or information besides you and your spouse? Yeah, that's one thing. A lot of times, no, that you don't give them anybody else's information from a family perspective that if something happened, you think, you know, it's either me or my spouse, you can get a hold of either of us. But if something happened to both of them, then at this point, um, you know, police come to the house and um, they find minor children there and the babysitter can't keep the kids, right? She's not related to them. She's a 16 year old girl lives down the street. So then Child Protective Services comes in and they try to find family that's close by. So at this point, if, you know, maybe if it's 
if you're if you're now in California and your family's all on the East Coast and they can't get a hold of anybody, then it's possible that child protective services would have to take the kids out of the home and put them in foster care until family was able to get to them. And so that's why it's really important to make sure that if you are in a place where you don't have family close by, you have this short-term guardian nomination where you have your neighbors, you have people from their school, you have somebody that you trust, that if there was an emergency, it there's this legal document that says, I have these I give them permission to be able to keep my kids until guardians are able to get to them so it gives any anybody that's coming from out of state the ability to you know, for them to hold the kids until those guardians are able to get to them and it's a, it's a really big thing that most people don't really consider right especially you know I see it for people that have that come from out of state and I know they're from out of state but I don't want to say anything to them I'm like hey do you have short-term guardians because it's not my place but so I'm just hoping they, they see some of the information that I have out there you know I was thinking about it from a financial perspective too, like what happens in the interim, but it's good to know that there's a form or just, you know, a way to protect your family in the short term also. Now, when it, when it's from a financial perspective, let's say that there is a will or a trust in place between the time that let's say the person passes away and when the will or the trust begins to take in effect, what is that time frame like and what happens in that in between? Yeah. So this is really where the difference between a will and a trust come into play can be have a, like a substantial impact. When you have a will, you have to file, file the petition with the court. And like right now, I, I just, I had a case in LA. We filed the petition in um so let's say last month so in july it's not set for a court hearing until november so that's july august september october november five months it's going to take which means that five month period the family has no access to the money because they are the the petition in court hasn't hasn't been granted allowing them to actually start going through the assets to access the bank account right so there's this very long period where the family they don't have access to the to that money, right? In which for some families that could be detrimental to their ability to live, to pay bills, to get groceries, you know. And so that's one one aspect to consider. When you have a trust, though, everything is in the name of your in your trust, right? That's if your if your trust is properly funded, meaning all of your assets are in the name of your trust, the way that it should be, the way that it's meant to be, then all it is is a matter of changing who that trustee is to then go access those bank accounts. And that can be done quickly because everything is in the name of the trust. And that's really where the difference between the will and the trust come in is, is it's just so much less headache, so much less work, so much less cost and time associated with it. Whereas a trust, it's going to make it quicker. It's going to be easier. And then if somebody had a trust and they needed to do that, change who the owner is to the trustee, is that done through you or like the appropriate whoever filed that or lawyers? Is that how that takes place? Yeah, so we can we can do that. It's part of the trust administration process. When somebody passes away, we, you know, prepare all of the stuff and try to help them, you know, get the get the stuff that they need to be able to do that. Um, did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it wouldn't like if let's say that I passed away and then my son is the trustee it wouldn't necessarily be that the guardian let's say that you were not my husband if, if Jason was not my husband <laughs> let's just say that you were my neighbor and Whoa, it wouldn't necessarily this is getting be, real spicy it wouldn't be that my neighbor has to implement that process it would be like you know yeah so it would be whoever you're emergency person is your successor trustee generally is okay. the one who would then uh, initiate all of that. Okay. Um, you know, it, it would be them that would start the process to get everything going. Do you find that there are many clients who actually choose to have you or your team or lawyers execute a trust on behalf of, of the family versus having like a, a specific family member do that? Is that common? Um, so I personally, or my team, we do not act as a fiduciary. We, if if, most of the time people can find family members or family friends that they trust 
to be able to act in that capacity. What we do use is we have a professional fiduciary that I work with that I will be able to name as a backup generally if they if they couldn't find somebody that they trust. And it happens, you know, they don't trust anybody with the money for the kids. They want somebody to oversee it and manage it for them on their behalf. One of the things I, I, I've seen a lot is, and to the detriment of the person who created it, is they'll name a bank, just randomly name a bank to act as the trustee. And a bank will only accept a trust to manage a trust if the asset level is over a certain amount. And it has to be pretty substantial. And so I, I've seen this recently where somebody came to me and they named two different banks. Neither bank would touch the administration. So we literally have to go to court to get a new trustee assigned, right? So it's, it's working through kind of those ideas of, okay, who would you want? If they couldn't do it, who would you want as a backup to them? And if they couldn't do it, you know, do you have another backup or we can use a professional? I could see a fiduciary being like a beneficial person just because there would be no emotion tied yeah, to exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. They are a third, they are third party. They're neutral. It's, you know, they're doing it for the benefit of the kids. Um, and there's no emotion associated with it for, you know, what they're being provided for. Yeah. And, you know, they're not friends potentially with the guardians. And so, it, you know, there isn't that kind of, you know, it's just, you know, they're held to a fiduciary capacity. Yeah. It's like, even if you, let's say that you are good at money, uh, like money management and, you know, you're the person that ends up being this, this selected person that would do that for someone. If somebody passed away and you're like very emotionally close to them, it, it would, mm -hmm. I could see it just being like difficult to like yeah. handle it and almost mentally just thinking like, someone else is taking care of this and I don't have to take care of it. Like a, like a, you know, someone else who knows exactly how to handle it sort of being a relief. Like I could see that being beneficial, even if you have people you trust and are good with money. Yeah. It's just like, it's, it's just a non partisan yeah. neutral party that can come in and handle it. No for you. drama, no drama. Really? Just, exactly. yeah, yeah. Just somebody that has the mental capacity to handle it without emotion. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, you know, you receive X, you receive X. I could see that being very common. Uh, you just touched on one thing that I, I think is a kind of a good point. Um, so sometimes I see where prior, prior to people coming to me to do planning, they will list um, on their life insurance policy, like their spouse and a sibling. So that if something happened, that sibling is then who's gonna be the guardian that they at least have in their mind, there's no planning or anything, documents in place, but they would want their sibling to get that money for the benefit of their kids to be able to provide. My issue with that is that sibling, while you absolutely love them and you trust them, they have nothing legally in writing that, that requires them to use that money for the benefit of your kids, right? So it's literally just them, if something happened to the primary and it, that money was a check that just goes to them directly with nothing that says, this is how it's to be used for the benefit of my kids. And so my issue with that is, is you can actually put it in the trust where you have the sibling as the person who manages it on the behalf of the trust. And as the trustee, they have this fiduciary um, requirement to manage it according to your wishes. And so, you know, that's one of the other things we're having that trust. It gives you that ability to put those specific instructions, you know, distribute it for health, education, maintenance, support, you know, camp, whatever those things provided at these ages. And it holds them to the standard to make sure that it's being managed for the benefit of the kids. Whereas if something happens in the future and they're not managing it for the benefit of the kids, they're self-dealing, meaning they're using their money for their own things. They, you know, bought a new Lamborghini or whatever it is. It's obviously not family oriented that it can fit a car seat. So, you know, it's, it's then they can be taken to court, right? And say, you're not following the instructions according to what you are supposed to do as the trustee. And so it's, it's really just making sure that there is that protection for the kids because I've seen it where people say, oh yeah, I was in my grandma's trust um, or, you know, I got money from my grandma in the will. My uncle was the one who was responsible for it and I never saw anything. Mm. Oh, one thing from a guardianship perspective that I think is important is, you know, sometimes when you're doing guardianship, you, you don't really think about this, but when you, when you're naming a couple to act as the guardian, you have the ability and this is what we, you know, really focus on and families making sure it's catered to what they want is you have the ability when you're naming a couple that if something happened to one of the couple, 
Like, let's say it was your best friend and, and her husband. Let's say you were in a car accident with your best friend, then her husband is then listed as the guardian for the kids. Would you want that? Maybe, maybe not. But you can specifically put language in there that says, you know, um, best friend and husband, you know, if something happened to best friend, she's okay alone, but not husband, then it would go to your next person, which may be, you know, a sibling or somebody else. And so it's really making sure that whatever your wishes are, you can legally document them and put them very specifically in those instructions. We love to leave the audience with a key takeaway. If there's one nugget that you would want to leave them with, what would that be? Uh, you need to nominate guardians for your minor children legally. So I know it's hard. I know that it's something people don't want to do, but without it, a court would have no idea who you would actually want. And so that's why having legally documented your guardian wishes is important. If you do that, so let's say that Jason was my brother and I wanted him to be the legal guardian. I have a conversation with him. Then I put it in my trust. Does he have to sign that trust also and agree? Okay, no. No, and it's not going to be in your trust. It's going to be a separate document or it's going to be in your will, right? So that the trust is going to be separate. But nominating guardians, like we do it as a separate document. We also put it in the will depending on what kind of planning people want. Um, you don't have to tell them. That I, was the just, I was about to say, like, so if they surprise. don't have to sign, I could make <laughs> Jim Carrey the I guardian of my I definitely recommend child. you have the conversation with them. Um, and sometimes that can be one of the challenging parts. And so the way that I approach it with people is just say, you know, if they're the primary, you tell them, hey, I'm working on guardian nominations. I want to put you down as our primary guardian. Make sure the primary knows. But maybe the primary guardian you want isn't your parents who would absolutely want to be guardians. And so you put your parents down as a backup. And so you tell your parents, okay, we're working on guardian nomination. We have you down as a potential guardian. And that you leave it at that. You don't need to tell them what order they're in, right? So that it, you know, they don't need a copy of it. Um, and so that way it, it lets everybody know you have that conversation. Um, and again, trying to be cognizant of feelings because I know that comes into play a lot. Are there any resources? It could be books, podcasts, websites, films that <laughs> you find are very helpful on this subject or any, any resources for parents that you would want to recommend for them? Um, so there's, there's a lot of information out there. Um, one of the things that we really pride ourselves on is just making it easy for parents to understand. Um, so I would actually use our website. I have a ton of YouTube videos that um, are all linked in our website that just go over very specific things like how to nominate guardians, um, um, how to nominate short-term guardians, what are things to consider when looking at a guardian, what is the difference between a will and a trust, what is probate court, all of these questions broken up into some shorter than others um, topic um, videos that just, you know, it's, it's, it's just that information to be able to kind of start going through and getting that idea of how to think through it. One thing that I will share um, that I'm happy to provide is um, my estate planning guide for parents. And so this really goes through, um, and I, it's a digital copy, so it's, it's um, so you can actually go through and um, like literally write in your choices here. And it's meant to be a guide that will help you be able to say, you know, this is who I would want to be guardians of my children. Um, so like for this one, it's all about how to name a successor trustee. Like what is it? I'm showing this to you, but obviously it's not visible in the podcast. It gives you information about, you know, what is this, what is this successor trustee? What do they do? What are things to consider? And then the guide actually gives you a spot to fill in who your choices are. So it kind of helps you kind of just start kind of formulating that process. I find the action, the action of actually writing it down to help you in the planning, because once you get it on paper, it sets it in your mind, right? Put it to the side, let it sit for a few days. How do you feel about it? If it's giving you anxiety, then it's probably not the right decision. You need to go back and look at who did you put as your choices. And then you, it at least gives you a starting point from there. So I'll make sure you get a link to that to be able to download it for your listeners. I love that. Thank That's you. Awesome. And if somebody is out of state, so if they're not in California, where would you recommend someone begin if they're looking into a resource that's similar to you, mm -hmm. estate planning, maybe somebody that specifically works with families that have young children, where yeah. would be a good place to begin? 
So um, you are more than welcome to reach out to me on, on Instagram. I do have attorneys that I have worked with throughout the country that I will generally refer if I find that they do kind of similar things to what we're doing. Uh, I am in, act, in the process of actually creating this network of attorneys that cater to young families. Um, so that's something for next year, 2021. So follow back up with that. Um, but you can also just Google like estate planning attorney, minor kids and see, is anybody writing blog posts? Is anybody teaching? Is anybody giving information about how to plan for minor kids? Because I find that unless they have a focus on it, they don't do as much from a planning perspective with minor kids. Like I've, I've had people that have come to me that they've met with other attorneys and were kind of designing their plan and they'll say, the other attorney didn't ask me any of these questions because that's not what their focus is on. Their focus is on transferring the assets and transferring the wealth. Our focus is on protecting the kids. And that's really where everything that we do stems from, which is why that's our focus. And what is your website, Instagram handle, social media, Facebook, all that? Yeah. So um, best place to find us, uh, find me is um, Instagram. It's at the state planning mom. Um, I have lots of information there. I share my life as an attorney, as well as a mom and the things that I do. Um, and that you can find links to our website, which is hermanslaw.com. Um, and our website, I love our website. It's, you know, it's my pride and joy over so many years of work because it just, it has a lot of stuff on there. It's very, you know, family oriented. It provides all of that information because it's for people who are getting started and want it. They want to get all that information. It's there. A ton of free principles on our website. Also, if you go there and, you know, checking all of the accounts that you have, you know, retirement, life insurance, it gives you a form to go in and list it. And who do you have as the beneficiaries so that if, you know, this, this is a great exercise when you're kind of starting all of this. It's all about organizing your plan, organizing the assets that you have, what life insurance, what retirement accounts, bank accounts, and really just listing them all out. Who do you have as the beneficiaries? Who's on the joint account? So that you have you have that knowledge and that idea. Because people forget. You know, I see I see it unfortunately where somebody will come in, it's a blended, it's a blended or it's a remarriage. And they'll we'll start talking through retirement accounts or life insurance and they'll be like, oh, yeah, I have my ex-wife listed on there from my prior marriage because I started that retirement account 20 years ago when I started that job. And then I see the wife, the new wife, look at the husband in disappointment and annoyance that it was never changed to the new wife. So this is a great exercise to make sure it's who you want it to be. And also just if you do change jobs, a lot of times you can roll over a 401k, but yeah. sometimes you don't. And mm -hmm. you're like, oh yeah, I think I have one. Yeah. And then you check it. You're like, oh my God, that has like $20,000 in it or something. <laughs> yeah. You're like, oh yeah, I should probably do something with that. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a good exactly. exercise. And I have no beneficiaries on it. So it would just go nowhere because I had it 20 years ago. So yeah, it, nobody has would... through, it has to go through probate at this point because there's no beneficiary. Uh. Yeah. Nobody would, <laughs> nobody would even know about nobody it. Nobody would even know. <laughs> and one more time for anyone listening, the website, hermanslaw.com. It's yes. H E R M A N C E L A W.com. Yeah, you can also get to it by going to estateplanningmom.com, which makes it a little easier. Um, I don't know how long that's going to be in effect, but for right now, it goes there. And we'll link it all in the show notes as well for everyone Perfect. listening. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, Krista, thank you so much. We, yes. Jason and I, have a lot of work to do. I hope our audience <laughs> uh, had a pen and paper while they were listening. And if they didn't, they're going to have to go back and listen again and take some copious notes because there was yeah. a lot of great information there. So thank you so Good. much. One, one thing I'll, I'll mention also is, um, so we, we see clients all throughout the state of California. So if you are in the state of California and you need to get a plan in place, you know, we have, we have clients that we service virtually, you know, San Diego, the Bay Area, San Francisco, Berkeley, everywhere. Um, and if you go to our website, you'll see like a schedule now. You can do a free 15 minute info call just to get information to get the process started. There's no obligation. And it just, you know, you do it all online. You have this phone call and then at least you have kind of a starting point. So I, I definitely recommend people that want that information to get started to go there. Thank you so much, Krista. We appreciate you joining us and our audience helping yeah. us to elevate the vibe. Thank and you. And yes, we look forward to hearing more about the network that you'll be creating in 2021. So yeah. we'll definitely stay up to date so we can share info about that as well. Perfect. Well, thank right. you again for having me.
Thank you so Thanks. much. All right. Have a good day. All right. You too. Bye. Bye. Hey there, Vibe Hive babes. If this podcast has brought you any value, please rate and review on your favorite listening platform. And if you're feeling really generous, share with a friend. Visit us at elevatethevibe.co for show notes on this episode and previous episodes. This podcast is intended to educate, entertain, and inspire. It is not intended to diagnose, treat, or substitute for professional medical advice. Please consult your healthcare provider with any questions you may have. And as always, thank you for joining us to Elevate the Vibe.